Welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast, interdisciplinary conversations about new works in the broad world of business research. I'm your host, Andrew Jennings. If you like what you hear today, please consider subscribing to the podcast or sharing with others who might like it too. And if you have ideas for future episodes, let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Our guests today are Grant Hayden, Professor of Law at Southern Methodist University, and Matthew Bodie, Professor of Law at St. Louis University. We'll be discussing their article, Co-Determination and Theory and Practice, which is forthcoming in the Florida Law Review. I'll link to the article in the show notes for the episode. Grant, Matt, welcome to the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thanks for having us. I wondered if we could start with a really basic question. What is co-determination? How does it work? And is it practiced in the United States or anywhere else? You know, co-determination has a couple different meanings. There's a kind of the broader sense of shared governance between employees and managers or owners of a company. And that is sometimes used to refer to the entire system. More specifically, co-determination often refers to the practice of having employee representatives on the governance board. So a board of directors, sometimes they go by different names in different countries. But the idea is that it's a system, a legal system that structures the corporation in such a way as to allow employees to have actual governance at the highest level and use that governance to participate in questions about what sorts of you know products are we going to make? Are we going to acquire another company? That sort of thing. So co-determination really is, in a sense, shared governance between the employees and the managers or owners through a system of board governance, usually, where there are representatives on the board. Germany is probably the most well-known country with co-determination, and their system has a 50% requirement for co-determination, meaning that for large companies, half of the board are employee representatives. Those representatives are on a supervisory board, which is, I think, pretty close to the board of directors under U.S. law. And there's often a a kind of a neutral or a chair who is a tie-breaking vote. And so employees have half of the board, but not necessarily control of the board. But the idea there is that the workers have significant say in running of the company at the highest levels and can have input at that level. But there are a number of other European countries as well that have a system of co-determination and there are different varieties to it. This is Grant. And even Germany, it's a little more differentiated. They have different varieties. If you're a small company, under 500 employees. All of the representatives on the supervisory board are elected by shareholders, much like it is here. If you've got between 500 and 2,000 employees, then you've got one third co-determination, a third of the representatives are elected by workers. And then, as Matt pointed out, if you have, if you're a large company, if you have over 2,000, then you're at either quasi parity co-determination where you get half the representatives, but the tie break is a shareholder representative, Or in some industries, the mining industry or coal, there are special rules that give you actual full co-determination in Germany. So it's pretty variable depending on the size of the company, along with the type of industry they're in. We see that this is a practice in Germany and, and perhaps some other countries. What's been the experience with this practice in terms of corporate governance or firm performance, shareholder value, even social values, labor values, et cetera? What's been the lay of the land? Good question. There are a lot of different ways to judge how effective co-determination is. For years, if you were to read about co-determination from the point of view of many Germans, they are very happy in judging it by its broader goals. The broader goals that they're very happy about it promoting are that they see it as promoting social cohesion. They see it as promoting fairness. That is, they see co-determination as part of their well-functioning democracy. And so from that broad point of view, I think it's been entirely successful. If you begin to focus on purely economic effects, I think early on, when you look at studies from the 1980s, 1990s, and the very early 2000s, you come up with a mixed picture. Some of the studies reveal very little effect at all on markers like productivity or profit margins. Some studies tended to show a slight reduction in profit margins or productivity. Most of those early studies at this point have been 
discounted in part because their methodologies judged by the lofty standards of today, I suppose, were relatively unsophisticated. And also because it was hard to disentangle the effects of adding the East German economy to the West German economy at the time. And so it was very difficult to take those effects apart. Now, in the last 15 years, there have been a number of studies on the effectiveness of co-determination from the point of view of many different corporate constituents. And so I'll run through quickly the bottom line. The overall consensus coming out of the last 15 years worth of work is positive. And certainly it's positive from the point of view of employees. That is, employees seem to be better off under their own measures under co-determination. Now, I say under their own measures because employees actually pay a wage premium under a co-determined corporation of about 3%, depending on the study you look at. That is, they give up some wages in return for job security, which is interesting. But we leave constituents to judge their own welfare by the markers that they consider important, and employees are better off. And this doesn't come at the expense of shareholders. That is, we don't see a lot of rent seeking. Shareholders themselves seem to be better off. That is, we have higher productivity. We have a positive effect on profitability. At least a number of studies have shown that. And so even shareholders seem better off. And then some of the other constituents, like creditors or those affected by corporate social responsibility kinds of measures, are also better off in large part because Employees seem to share with some of them a longer term view of the corporation. And so those, because they line up on that front, they tend to be better off. So that's a long answer to a short question. But essentially, over the last 15 years, we've just seen an explosion of studies and the consensus, even within the meta studies, are it has a positive effect, even from the point of view of shareholders, which I think is, you know, might surprise some people. That's been the experience in Germany outside of the U.S. How has the idea of co-determination been treated in U.S. policy and in academic circles? Where does it stand now and how does it challenge or maybe even fit a shareholder primacy model? Well, it doesn't fit it at all. (laughs) In a way, it's kind of the polar opposite. Well, it's not the polar opposite. I guess the polar opposite would be a worker primacy model. So co-determination is just splitting the splitting the control. When it comes from the point of view of legal scholarship, at least in the United States, really for years, co-determination was completely ignored, almost completely ignored by those writing in corporate governance scholarship. I have a shelf full of books that go on, each of which go on for hundreds of pages and extol the, the virtues of shareholder primacy and the exclusive shareholder franchise. And, you know, at best, you'll get a couple pages on co-determination. In most cases, you get maybe one or two mentions, and that's it. So I think for a long time, it was just ignored, and I'm not sure why. Then, to the extent that anyone was paying attention to it, it looks like scholars were focusing on the fact that German co-determination was mandated by statute, and that was used as part of an argument for why shareholder primacy was a superior system. And the argument went something like this, and you've heard versions of this argument in law and economic circles, probably not only in corporate governance, but across the board. So the argument goes something like this. If co-determination is great, firms would voluntarily adopt it. They haven't. So that alone tells us it must be less efficient than the alternative, which is shareholder control over a company. And corollary to that is really the only way you can get co-determination is by mandating it by statute, which is what Germany does. Now, a lot of scholars have made versions of this argument. Roberto Romano's made it, Stephen Bainbridge has made it, George Dent, Hansman and Crackman. It really originated, though, in an article in 1979 by Jensen and Meckling, who argued that without fiat, that is without a government mandating a co-determination governance system, it would never exist. And they actually went on to make a prediction in 1979 that German co-determination was either going to devolve into shareholder control, and so it would end up just looking like the U.S. system, or workers were going to end up taking over corporations in Germany 
And the German economy was going to grind to a halt, like in their words, Tito's Yugoslavia. So we obviously think, and part of this article we wrote goes through some of the shortcomings in those arguments. For example, I mean, to the extent the arguments make a prediction about the collapse of the German economy, that prediction has been decisively refuted. The German economy continues to thrive and actually weathered the 2008 global crisis better than most other economies. The story itself about the adoption of co-determination, it being by fiat, is itself wrong. A British scholar, Ewan McGoey, has written an article that goes into the history of co-determination in Germany that points out that co-determination actually arose first through agreement in Germany and later developed into a social consensus and only at that point became embodied in law. The story itself is wrong, that it will only arise through governmental fiat, when in Germany, actually the opposite was true. It actually arose twice through agreement or bargaining, only to be actually gotten rid of by law a couple of times and then reinstated into law later. And then on top of that, the article goes into this in more depth, but there are all sorts of reasons why co-determination or a co-determined board might not be voluntarily adopted in the United States by U.S. corporations, even if it increases overall utility. You know, shareholders, for one, if they think they're going to lose out, whether it's true or not that they'll end up losing out, they aren't likely to adopt a system like that, and they are in control of the significant corporate decisions now, ultimately anyway. There are collective action problems. There's path dependency and network effects of shareholder primacy that basically make it very difficult for a company to just voluntarily adopt unilaterally a co-determined system in the United States. So again, long answer to a short question. And I think Matt's got some thoughts. I think I would just add that The mindset here, I think, has changed in the United States in two ways. One is we've seen the flowering of the law and economics approach in the 70s and 80s really develop, have a dominant position in the corporate law academy. And we've seen some of the difficulties that that creates. I think one result of the dominance of that position has been a focus on shareholder returns And that has been extremely successful in a lot of ways. But you've seen the power of particularly workers within the corporation really decline over that time. If you look at the change in corporate profits versus average wages, you can kind of see the line go up with regard to the profits and the line go down with regard to the wages. So, And because the German system, as Grant was suggesting, has not disappeared, has not morphed into something equivalent to the U.S. system, but instead has maintained its own vibrancy and has really carved out this alternative approach, I think you're seeing people starting to think about that. And I know it's something that, as we've talked about, our papers over the years calling into question some aspects of the shareholder primacy model that a lot of people have said, well, you know, there's that co-determination alternative, but that's just a German thing. And so I think people are starting to think about, well, maybe we could explore something along those lines. Maybe it's not just a German thing. Maybe it's something that U.S. corporate law models could adopt as well. And then what effects will that have on our system? Is this going to be a positive thing? How will shareholders react? I think we're seeing that on the evidence that a lot of these empirical studies have been doing, which is what Grant was talking about earlier. Grant has mentioned some of the empirical studies in the last few years. How has the evidence that's mounted in literature on co-determination and its performance, how does that challenge U.S. attitudes or assumptions toward co-determination in this country? Well, it certainly challenges them in the sense that to the extent they're even out there, the assumption is that it's a system that has to be worse, especially for shareholders. And the only way you could ever get to such a system is by mandating it. I'd have to say I haven't seen corporate governance scholars really take up in earnest in any way the studies coming out over the last 10 or 15 years that tend to show that co-determination is not only a robust system, but it tends to have benefits that we didn't even know about, like smoothing over things like employment or unemployment numbers during the global crisis in 2008. So I don't think we've really seen any attention paid to it. In fact, that's part of the reason why we wrote the article is to gather up all in one place 
and try and lay out where we are when it comes to co-determination in theory and in practice. To the extent that there's been a recent move in the area, I think the move has been to say, okay, 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 maybe co-determination is okay for Germany, but it just won't work in the United States. And I think that's the move we're going to see moving forward. So far, at least the articles I've read or the thinkers I've read about making that move have not been especially convincing to me. But that seems to be the rhetorical or argumentative move made by corporate governance scholars in the U.S., And from my perspective, the frustrating thing about some of those arguments is, one, there's the argument that Germany has a much more robust system of unionization top to bottom. So they have workers' councils and they often have sectoral bargaining within various industries. The idea there is that because they have this robust shop floor level engagement, that that makes co-determination more valuable. And I mean, I would agree with that in principle, but I think there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem here, too, because We've seen a real decline in unionization in the United States. To say that it it wouldn't be useful for workers to have representatives at the board level, I think we should wait until we have this robust set of unionized workplaces. I think in some ways is basically saying we shouldn't try to deal with the problem partially until we can deal with it perfectly. And that to me just doesn't make a lot of sense. What should listeners, especially those in corporate governance academia or in corporate governance practice, what should they take from this article and from this conversation? I think what they should take is to look at the literature that's out there and really think about it in terms of, should I re-examine my priors with respect to whether a system like co-determination could work under the theory that we have here in the United States, the preeminent law and economics approach, shareholder wealth maximization approach. Should we look at this other system and really kind of engage with it and think of it as a possible alternative? And I think if you look at the evidence, the evidence for shareholders is in a lot of ways positive for them. And I think particularly with regard to risk management, something we saw in the 2008 crisis, a lot of the literature around that, which Grant was referring to earlier, shows that co-determination was better able to manage that, that workers were in fact willing to sacrifice their hours in order to save jobs. So workers uh, worked less and received lower pay, but they avoided a lot of the layoffs that the U.S. system had and a lot of the wreckage that can come with mass unemployment or at least you know steep, quick unemployment. And I think you're seeing some of that too with respect to the coronavirus response as well in Germany, although it's just too early to you know have a lot of those event studies that we've seen coming out with regard to the 2008 crisis. So I would say think about the possibility that a system of shared governance might make sense. We've seen really a binary focus on either a, a full-throated shareholder wealth maximization or a softer system of stakeholder governance where everyone is meant to come under the aegis of the board and the board has to take all these competing considerations and all these different groups into account. What we're saying is that employees really are special here, that they really do deserve uh, a special place in governance and that a system like co-determination really makes a lot of sense to manage that by giving workers real power. There's a new article out by former Chief Justice of Delaware, Leo Strine, and two co-authors, where he is essentially saying, you know, there is a lot that's broken about the U.S. system, particularly with respect to labor law, and takes this co-determination idea under consideration. Now, that article suggests that there might be other steps we want to take before we turn to co-determination. We might not agree with the article in that respect, but we're certainly happy that someone as respected as Chief Justice Strine is examining that system and taking it seriously and thinking about what the ramifications would be for the United States. And more broadly, when it comes to corporate governance scholarship, when it comes to the core of corporate governance scholarship, shareholder primacy, and when it comes to the signature feature of shareholder primacy, which is the fact that shareholders and shareholders alone end up ultimately voting on the members of the board of directors, I think a lot of the arguments that underpin that system have just crumbled over the last 20 or 30 years, and there's been no attempt to resuscitate those arguments. And so we're in this situation where we've got the theoretical arguments at the core of shareholder primacy are just not holding up. And when you couple that with this alternative system, which we're now discovering empirically through the work of bunches of economists, is actually not all that bad. I think those two things fit pretty well together. 
and should allow us and everyone else to begin to not only re-examine the theoretical systems you have in place, which I think are falling apart, but also look to this new empirical data for guidance going forward. Our guests today have been Grant Hayden, Professor of Law at Southern Methodist University, and Matthew Bodie, Professor of Law at St. Louis University. We've discussed their article, Co-Determination in Theory and Practice, which is forthcoming in the Florida Law Review. I'll link to the article in the show notes for the episode. Grant, Matt, thank you for joining the Business Scholarship Podcast. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you very much, Andrew. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Business Scholarship Podcast. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing to the podcast or leaving a rating on your favorite podcast app, or let other people know about it too. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please let me know. My email address is andrew at andrewkjennings.com, and I look forward to hearing from you. Until the next time, I'm your host, Andrew Jennings.